just I need to get something off my chest though. Go ahead, proceed, bro. How many times in sport have you heard people say failure is not an option? Yeah, all the time. Coaches all the time. Most of But the pressure of failing is real. Mm. And regardless of you, I, whoever, you may be the best of the best at what you do. But at the end of the day, it's hard living up to that standard, bro. Behind the mask. What up, my boy? What's good, family? Another day in paradise. You know what it is. Hey, man, like, I already know, like, it's good to be here and we can yeah. chop it up and everything. Always. But I just, I need to get something off my chest, though. Go ahead, proceed, bro. How many times in sport have you heard people say, failure is not an option? Yeah, all the time. Coaches all the time. Most of But the pressure of failing is real. Mm. And regardless of you, I, whoever, you may be the best of the best at what you do. But at the end of the day, it's hard living up to that standard, bro. Yeah, no doubt, man. That's that's a deep one, bro. And um, we talked about the the privilege that we have, the status that we have, uh, how we're really put on a pedestal from from a young child uh, to where we at now in our lives. You know what I mean? And to that point, though, the crazy part is when you start to peel back the layers, you start to go behind the mask you realize that we're not much different than the people that are listening and watching us right now. That's real talk. You know what I'm saying? Like, Regardless of whatever craft or trade that you're in, yeah. we all the same. We all the same. And, and we may be cut different, but we all the same. Um, I think the difference is we know how to compartmentalize it, right? We know how to leave things off the field when we step across that line. So if it's a, a breakup, a divorce, if you're dealing with financial issues, uh, things with your physical or mental health, family issues, we know mm. how to compartmentalize it and put it in a box to where we're like, okay, we know how to move on and kind of deal with that pressure a little bit better than most, right? And you you talking about feeling, thinking about this, you were all state, you were um, all, what oh, else? All, what'd you just say? You was all state at Waco, right? In, in high school. Man, don't you ever... All state. Yeah. I wouldn't be sitting in front of you right now in this studio if I was just all state. Man, I was all American. Double A, sir. All Don't right, you man. dare do that. I, Were you, you was all state up there in New York? Nah, I was all city. It's different because, like, in New York, the city's big and we don't really. Hold on. You, know, you wasn't all state, but you saying you were. All, it's all city. It's like the five boroughs. The five boroughs is so big, so all city is recognized more than all state in New York City. Bro, that's just like trying to take soccer and put it in the South and say <laughs> soccer is way better than football. Listen, man, let me get, let me get back to old point of what I'm saying. Man, you don't disrespect all, me like bad, that my again, apology, man. Yo, you were all American. Thank you. Right? <laughs> all SEC, all American. In, in, <laughs> all SEC, all American. Um, and then in the league, all pro. You know what I'm saying? Hall of Fame nominee. So when, when you talk about pressure... For me, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's hard to feel or hard to see Tequil Spikes as somebody that deals with pressure. You know what I'm saying? So when did you deal with pressure, Mr. All-American, All-SEC, All-American, first-round draft pick, Hall of Fame nominee, all of that? Thank how? you. Thank pressure you for how? Introduction. But no, I, that's a good point. Because I didn't realize that up until I was in my, you know, the middle years in between five and ten in the league. And I had a teammate. He came up to me and he was like, man, things just always go your way, huh? Yeah. And I was like, who? <laughs> what you mean? Like, man, think about the stuff that just happened for you game after game. And I was like, you just discrediting all of the damn work that I put in. Mm. Like, it's a process, bro. Mm. Because for me, I, I truly believe I try to minimize pressure yeah. because pressure is going to come. The pressure of failing is always going to be in that thought process. 
But for me, I try to minimize that. I, I give you a prime, like, okay, okay, good story. All right. <laughs> um, first time me dealing with pressure mm -hmm. was I was in college. It was upcoming on my junior year. And I was reading this magazine, no lie, bro. I just had finished the spring semester, spring quarter back then. Mm. And I was reading this magazine, and this magazine talked about um, Spice got a chance to go into the draft. And, you know, for me, I'm just like, oh, no. Watch for the hook. Yeah, you always, always say that. I'm like, oh, no. I'm not reading any press clippings. Put it down. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, all right, let me read it again. <laughs> and so what it did to me... I was reading it, and it was saying this guy had a great year, freshman year, sophomore year. If he continues to excel, he will have a good chance as far as going into the league, being a first-round pick. Mm. I did not want to entertain myself with that, but I did. Like, we all think, like, hey, don't read your press clippings. We are. Bullshit. Yeah. We do read all press yeah, clippings. Most definitely. You know, that develops a little, you know, a little edge on you. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the story, after I read it, internal pressure was applied to me. And let me tell you how it manifested. So for me, I was, I said it was spring. We were going into summer. The only way that you could stay on campus at school is you have to go to summer, summer school. school. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, man, you don't make me go to school since August all the way until May. You think I'm going to sign up for school again? <laughs> Hell no. So I was like, no, I ain't going to school. I'm going to just work. So I worked yeah. at Coca-Cola. And, you know, I've just, you know, kind of helped my boys out stay at their crib. So, mm -hmm. long story short, the pressure built up in me, me trying to work in the summertime and then make workouts on time to ensure that I have a chance to go pro. What happened was internally, it manifested itself into hives. Mm -hmm. And when, when I caught hives, um, they didn't know what it was. You know, I had a rash on my arm, and they was just like, bro, I went like several weeks, two weeks, and then they figured out, okay, we're going to treat you for highs, but we don't know what this is. Yeah. And so then what happened after that, that eventually turned into a week later, I had acid reflux. Now, I went five, six weeks without even knowing what I had. I lost 15 pounds. Every time I ate a meal, I would throw up. Anytime, only thing that I could do without throwing up was just drink something. And I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was food poisoned. Yeah. And this went on for like over a month. But my point is, is the pressure that I applied to myself internally, because I was thinking, oh man, I got to go to the pros. I don't want to go to summer school because I ain't trying to worry about mm. doing homework. So I'm waking up at 5 in the morning, going to work, you know, dropping off sodas and shit. <laughs> and then at 1, 2 o'clock, I'm coming back to the facility. Everybody is leaving. Mm -hmm. I'm out there, and it's one of the hottest I places did. in America. And you out there running and lifting weights. But I did it. But that internal pressure that I put on myself, bro, it was eating at me from the inside. And so when I hit, then I think of that thought, of him saying that, I thought back to like, bro, I'm not, I'm no different than you. It's just yeah. how we compartmentalize it. Yeah, you're able to deal with it on on different levels than than you know your average person would be able to to deal with it, man. And that, first of all, that's crazy. Like I've I've never even thought I didn't I never thought that you could almost eat yourself alive. You know what I'm saying? From from the inside out. You know what I'm saying? Like you pretty much destroying yourself because you're internalizing that pressure. Yeah, that stress you know I mean? was so that stress, yeah. It, it, it was it was it was huge. That's crazy. It was hard because everybody goes through stress yeah. in stressful times. Yeah, yeah. But it's how you deal with it. How can you mm -hmm. compartmentalize it, put it in a in a bag, literally, and just say, this is over there whenever I choose to deal with it. Yeah. Don't make it no bigger than what it is. And it sounds yeah. easier than said that it's easier said than done, but that was the thought process behind it. Yeah, and I think back to times where, like I've been, I, I, you know me, I'm I'm laid back, I'm chill. I, I I'm like the I don't duck. Really see like I'm the duck 
in the rain, bro. Like the waters, you know what I'm saying, rolling off my back, but I'm still under under, you know, paddling up under the water. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I mean? I don't I don't sleep. I just keep going, keep going, keep going. I always say, as soon as you slow down, that's when the, the stress and the pressure are gonna catch up to you. So for me, I deal with it by keeping just keep going. You know what I mean? It works for me. I'm not saying it's the most healthy healthy thing. But it works for me. But give me one of your most but stressful times, then, if you I, had one. Yeah. I don't. I don't, and no, I don't believe you had, had one, really. some. Yeah, but, but again, I like to keep going so the stress don't catch up to me. But I think back to my my rookie year in the league uh, with the Saints, and you know, when you back then when you got uh, drafted or whatever, they they hold an interview with you in the team facility, and they say, okay. You know, what's your name? You know, what do you what do you aspire to be? What do you want to do? They said, what are your goals? What are your aspirations about being in the NFL now? And I was like, yo, I want to be the best father I could be. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. But like, what do you desire to be now that you're an NFL player? I said, the best father that I can be. Best father to my son. So the cameraman looks away, looks to the side. And they said, no, so no, no, no Pro Bowl, no starting as a rookie, no Super Bowl for the team, none of that. I said, my goal, my aspirations, my dreams are to be the best father I can be to my son, Tyreek. That was it. That was From my goal. From a football goal. goal. He, that, it, was it, your, that was that, your football that, They said, what are your goals now that you made it to the NFL? And I said, yeah, the way I get to that is through being in the NFL. That's going to help me. But I'm still going to be a great father. That, that ain't no me, Spice. That's just me, bro. I, that, I, I, but I, w- I will say this. It's your story, and I'm not trying to tell you. I am telling you to stop because I don't. It's a disconnect for me. How? Uh, I answered the question. What are your goals? But that ain't got nothing to do with. All right. Football wasn't I, stressful for me. Football was fun. Football was a hustle. Football was a means to an end. My pressure came from being a good father because you know we had the story before my dad wasn't in my life growing up so mm. wasn't consistently in my life growing up I should say so for me any stress would have been not being that for Ty gotcha. you feel me so that was the the stress uh. and when it came to football the only thing that really one of the only things I would say that was stressful going to my fast forward to my third year in the NFL I was on three teams my third year still with the Saints in the beginning of the season then wound up getting cut Got picked up by Tampa Tampa Bay. Uh, quick cup of coffee down there. Had some grace down there. John Lynch, Warren Sapp, Simeon Rice. You know what I'm saying? Keyshawn Johnson, some some real talent. I'm like, damn, this team is good. This team is going to go to the Super Bowl. Literally by week six, I could see that. Yo, we going to go. So I stayed there for about, I'm going to say six, six weeks or so to Thanksgiving. And then uh, Thanksgiving, my agent called me. I remember my mother came down. Ty came down. My agent calls me and says, uh, what are you doing? I'm like, yo, we shopping for Thanksgiving. It's like the Monday before Thanksgiving. He's like, uh, well, pack your bags. You're going to, to Charlotte. Said, what am I going to Charlotte for? He's like, the Carol- <laughs> <laughs> the, Panth- <laughs> the Panthers picked you up off of waivers. Because the Bucks, what they would do is they would um, release me because I, 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 I dressed out a few games. Then I wasn't playing. Team was going on a hell of a run. They would release me Saturday before the game. I would clear waivers by the next Tuesday, and then they would sign me back. So shout out to, to Rich McKay. Uh, I think it's Rich McKay or John McKay, one of the, one yeah, of the Rich McKay's. McKay. Rich McKay. Yeah. He was like, yo, we're going to give you your big check. So you're going to be on the active roster during the week. But we like, I think, 10 and 2 or something like that time. He's like, we're not messing with the offensive line. There's no need to. I don't care if the offensive line is not that good. We're just not messing with it. But you're going to get your money. So I'm just like, yo, I want to play. It's not happening. Screw it. So when I told my agent, I said, yo, I'm not going to Carolina. Because they was last in the, in the league at the time. They, they 2 and 10. They, they so I'm going from off 10. To die. <laughs> yo, so I'm going from 10 and That's 2. That's stress. I'm going from 10 and 2 to 2 and 10. I'm like, nah, I want to go. I said, what happens if I don't go to Carolina? To the Panthers. They're like, if you don't go, you won't get blackballed out the NFL because you're not going to an opportunity where you can play. You're not playing up there in Tampa. So I'm like, all right, shit. So I, I said, well, tell them I come in more. Fast forward, I go to Carolina. It leads to a four-year uh Four year stint with the Panthers, go to the Super Bowl, NFC Championship. My career took off. Yeah. But the stress right there was like, you know what I mean? What's going to happen next? And I remember talking to my dad, like, I called him, I said, yo, man, you wouldn't believe this. I, you know, thought I was going to be on Tampa doing my thing. I know we're going to the Super Bowl. Guys are good. Weather's beautiful. You know what I'm saying? No state taxes. 
And he said, uh, well, you about to go to another team? I said, yeah. He's like, you know, it's your third team in three in, in one year. I know. He's like, well, maybe this ain't the profession for you. So I'm like, hey, that ain't yeah. the shit I wanted to hear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't want to hear that. That was an uppercut. That's an uppercut. And again, for somebody, you know, at the time, and, you know, we made amends and everything, but that wasn't in my life like that. I'm like, God damn, here go the pressure. So that's the first time I felt the pressure because now, not only did I make amends with my dad, we growing, you know, we, we developing our relationship as adults, but the pressure is now I'm not living up to him because he's, football was the commonality that really brought us back together. Got so that you. was my pressure. Like, damn, he's like, maybe this ain't for you. How? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that, that was, that was tough and it, it ate me up. But again, how to compartmentalize it, going to Carolina, doing my thing, getting on the field, playing, take my career, taking off from there. So it's tough though, but bro, everybody gets fired at some point in their life, right? Yeah, that's so true. So it's like, you find a way to deal with it, man. Yeah, and even another story that was, so you made me really relate because I would have felt a certain type of way. No, I did. Like, you know, forgive me. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes I see stuff the way I see it. Perspective. When he asks you about, you know, what you know, what are some of the goals that you have? And you was like, well, to be the best father that I can be. If I was your teammate hearing you say that, I would have been like, what the fuck? Is, like, like do, are you even supposed to be here? It's my goal. You're right, but still, I wanted to make it my goal. <laughs> that was that's well, number one. I admit really? I'm wrong for that. Number two, this is where I'm really wrong. It's the perspective of how you see things because yeah. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a two parent home, so I, I'm not gonna say I took it for granted, but because that's what I saw, and I dealt with all the time. For me, that was my reality, and I just assumed everybody, yeah. even at that. In my 20s age, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, my apologies on that. Now, you didn't have no pressure of, you know, that yeah, dynamic. To me, you know that I mean? wasn't pressure. That was, like, that was everyday life. Yeah, yeah, pressure for me, like going out there like, man, I'm trying to supersede the expectations that you have for me. And I want to perform up to my level. But another pressure story for me, because I had that perspective of two parents in the household, this goes back to when I was in Cincinnati and my fourth year in the league. And I still remember this. It, I just had finished my third year in the league. And uh, Lowe's hit me. He was like, hey, man, we're going to All-Star All -Star Weekend. It was in D.C. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, let's go. Let's hit it. I'm Chocolate ready. City. Chocolate sure. City. Chocolate Thunder is coming. <laughs> Here I come. <laughs> It was popping though. Oh, it was yeah. listen. So I'm like, all right, I'm packing my stuff. I'm getting ready to leave on like a five o'clock flight. I never forget this. My mother calls me and she says, Keo, you need to come home. Mm. And I was like, what I need to come home for? And she was like, your daddy ain't doing well. Like he's sick. And I'm like, man, I'm. My so many thoughts went through my mind because I listen, my dad was like tougher than woodpecker lips now. <laughs> like this dude is like beef jerky tough. I've never seen him have a common cold. And when she told me that, I didn't even fight it. I was just like, all right. <sighs> Hung up the phone. And I knew. So I went home, you know, we went to the hospital and all of that stuff, and I found out, we all found out together that he had, he was passing out, you know, just get dizzy and have dizzy spells. He ended up having glioblastoma, cancerous tumor that was on his brain. Mm. And um, I remember I was like, man, this this my Superman, like, you know, like, I, I ain't want to hear it. So, I, you know, we asked the doctor, like, can we get it cut out? What, you know, whoop to whoop. And then the doctor was like, well, you don't really understand how serious this is because most people who have it, they're lucky to live a, ye a year at the longest. They just continue to deteriorate. 
And this was back in February. Mm. And so, you know, we prayed, you know, like it just hurt. So that was like pressure of me. And I'm just thinking like, man, I ain't never been through nothing like this before. So I go through the off season, spend as much time as I possibly can at home with my father. Because at that time, we had we had the surgery and they told my father that, well, they we didn't tell him, but, you know, they told us like, well, you know, we're giving maybe like, you know, 10 to 12 months to live. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was, we talk about the pressure, the stress. Yeah. All of that was put on me, and this was just in the month of May. So, you know, I, I come from a praying background. So we praying, doing all of the right things. I'm flying pops out to some of the best doctors in the world, and the result is the same, trying different treatments. And this is where the pressure and stress really jumped on me. Right before training camp, you know, we go to last week in July, and – I remember I had to make a, it was a choice I had to make. Mm -hmm. I knew the doctors telling me and my family, my father may not be living by the time I come, if, if I come back home. And I, for me, that didn't sit well with me. So what I did, I I was like, man, I, I remember telling Dick LeBeau, I'll be there when I get there. Mm -hmm. And it was just, and I didn't care how he took it. But Dick Dick was great with me. Mark Duffner, he was great with me. Those guys said, you know, just take your time. And I remember after a week being at home and still not being in training camp, I just, I still didn't want to go. So they hit me again. And I was at my mother's house. And I remember, like, I just went off. I was just like, like, don't be, you know, fucking calling me like you know what I mean like I went completely off and from that point when I hung up the phone like my my parents saw like the stress and the pressure that was put on me because it was the pressure of like I was always taught you know family first now I was also taught in the same sentence not a period but comma be a man of your word. Whatever you say you're going to do, you do it. Mm. Whatever you're contracted out to do, you do it. And they, we all knew this was a lifelong dream of mine that essentially I changed generations. Yeah. You know, from the payday that I was able to receive from being drafted with the Cincinnati Bengals. And so that was my conflict of interest when it came to pressure. And I... I and... I wasn't going to go back for another, I don't know. Yeah. But to wrap the story, my mom and dad, they kind of gave, they gave me the blessing. They was just like, what are you going to do here? You know, like, you can sit here, and, but you can't, you can't do nothing. You know, you, you call, we always going to be here, so you can call and pick up. At that time, my sister, she was in, I think she she was just finishing up her undergrad and she was going to be a nurse. Mm. And um, so she, you know, they just kind of gave me that comforting feeling of like, like, your daddy going to be all right. You know, like, we got you. And so from that time period, when he said that to me and this, they're going back to the teammate, I thought of stress and pressure. And I was like, man, I've been through some of the damn hardest like nut crunching times of all time. Mm-hmm. And this was the decision I had to make. So by them comforting me in that way, I decided to go back, you know, and and you know, my father he he passed away, yeah. you know, like three, four, three months later after that. But um that was pressure, man. Yeah. And and you chose to deal with it because you had an opportunity either to go back on uh go back to training camp but you still would have felt some sort of pressure wondering what was going on back, yeah. at, back at home. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you would have had to, like I said before, compartmentalize and find something within you to say, all right, this is that, but now I'm here. And it's so it's so damn near unfair because it's a job at the end of the day. Now, yes, it's a dream. 
it's a dream job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a lifelong uh, aspiration that we've all had, but it's crazy because you, as a 20-something-year-old, you're put in a position where it's like, all right, you know, the pressure of this or the pressure of that, family or my job. And, I, you know, we're not saying that this is the most intense feeling in the world because there are people that their jobs, military, their jobs are actually to... To put their life on their the line. Their life every, on the line every, every day. day. And that's... You have to compartmentalize some sort of pressure with that, knowing that bullets is flying. We, we know people, family members, and friends that have been in wars and been in the military that say, yeah, this is some real shit where we just... You got to kind of block out the... The bullets, you know what I mean? And, and you know, to think of on the field pressure, bullets, man, that the only real pressure I felt on the field is I was with the Jags <laughs> and I was a, a backup guard. I think it's my eighth year in the league, something like that. Eighth, eighth year, eighth and ninth year. And they called me nickel guard. You know, you got nickel backs that come in on third down and, yeah. you know, passing situation. You was a specialist when it came to rushers that when they like to do games up front and sack the quarterback. Mike Tice gave me the name and put it in the in the playbook, nickel guard. And I would run off the field on third down to pass the situations. <laughs> and I was pass blocking specialists at guard, man. Crazy. And we, how it happened, we playing against the Colts in Indy. Peyton Man is the quarterback, and we wound up being down three, about a buck 38 left. So we got a score, right? Two minute drill. The most intense, pressure filled part of a game for offensive lineman is two minute drill. Why? Because everybody, all 70,000 people in the audience in the stadium, know it's a passing situation. That means the defense, which I call it, Ears pimp back. P pin your ears pin back. Pin your ears back. Lick your chops. Because all you want to do is go after the quarterback. And that's where you make your money to get because sacks. Because the percentages go up. E if you get a sack in a two-minute drill, that gives you maybe a 70% chance of winning, winning the football the, game. Of winning the game. And for offense, when a quarterback typically throws an interception in two-minute drill, what is it because of? Pressure. Pressure. <laughs> defense a lot. So offense alignment, we know that. Our technique has to be right. And now think about it. You're down three. Oh, you're down two. If we go down, kick a field goal. We don't got to score. We kick a field goal, we win. So we like, all right, cool, bet. So I'm, I'm out there. I just came off a special team as a backup. You know what I mean? Kick off return and everything. I get to the sideline, and uh, first down comes up, second down. And I see Mike Tice keep looking back. I'm sitting on the bench. Tice, Tice keep, and he's on the headphone. He looking at me. I'm like, who the hell you looking at me? <laughs> what you looking at me for? You know what I'm saying? So I just hear him pull a, pull a thing. Hey, Toot, you ready? I'm like, ready for what? He said, you ready going? I'm like, no. Because I'm thinking it's 138 left. What am I going in for at this point? You know what I'm saying? Nickel guard. I'm like, oh, shit. So I go up there. Now think about who's on the other side at this time. And, what is it? 2008. 2009, 2008. Oh, that's uh, Dwight, Dwight, Dwight Freeney, Freeney Robert, Robert Mathis, Raheem Brock, and they had this package that they called NASCAR. You know why they call it NASCAR? Because all they you hear, ass. And all you hear is, <laughs> you know, going everywhere. Defensive line going this way, running them games, two defensive ends going this way, another one looping. Freeney on the left side coming all the way to the right side. You're like, what the hell you doing over here? Like, they flying everywhere. All you see is blue jerseys just going everywhere, everywhere. So I'm out there, and then I go back to trusting the technique because it's pressure. And I'm like, they put me in a situation. I haven't played the whole game except for special teams, and now I'm in there, and the pressure's on me to not fuck this up. So we go down there, and I'm just like, all right, I'm going to study the plays. I know what they're going to do. They're not really trying to be physical. They're just trying to get to gaps. Yep. Get to gaps, get the quarterback off his, off his point, right? So I'm throwing guys this way, going this way, sliding my feet, going this way. <laughs> all this stuff. <laughs> But we get down there, get in field goal range. We make it like maybe 16 seconds left, something like that. We down there. I'm like, I did my job. Then they called me out. All right, field goal to come back out. I get to the sideline. Mike Tice high-fiving me. Fred Taylor high-fiving me. All these cats, they like, yeah, yo, you did the damn thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know what, nothing. But boy, inside, yo, heartbeat sound like Sasquatch beat up something <laughs> So nervous, Spice, man. But that pressure, boy, you got to find a way to internalize it 
put it to the side and go out there and do your job, man. And, and, and mine was a little bit less, you know, intense than what you had to deal with, obviously. But we all go through it in some shape, form, or fashion. And shit, they say what? Pressure either uh, bus pipes or make diamonds. Make diamonds. So I made a couple of diamonds that day. Yes, you did. You got it in your ear still, too. You I see you over there. See you over there shining? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I, I, I think the best thing, though, when you look at it is, like, failure can be the best teacher of all time. You just got to be open and willing to, to receive the learning lesson from it. You know, and sometimes, like, when we talk about stress, we talk about the pressure, yeah, it's gonna make you it's gonna make you react and do certain things that you typically wouldn't do. Right. But, you know, I think my message probably to everybody to who's listening is to understand that just be open to receiving what you get out of the lesson. Yeah. Because, you know, nobody comes out the womb built, ready, made. Mm -hmm. Like you have to get calloused. Yeah. You have to get that ass toe up a few times in order for you to know like what you're really made of in order for you to, to become the person that you're destined to be. Yeah. You know, the one person who I think about is Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. okay. Like, think if he would have quit after the first time that he took his, his IP, his cartoon, to get it published. Because he yeah. did. He got rejected. Yeah, several times. Several times. Yeah. So if he would not have had the fortitude to continue to keep going, Bro, I, we would not even heard of Walt Disney. Yeah. You know, and I know, like, yeah, it kind of maybe a little funny or whatever, but for real, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, now, everybody yeah. of status that has achieved something of a greater measure, like, you went through something to get to that. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's the part that I want to just share. Like, man, don't ever lose out on that. Yeah, yeah. And because, good. you know, I don't know anybody who's built, made, ready, tough. Nah. If you haven't been calloused first. Yeah, yeah. One of my teachers used to tell me suffering builds character. I'm like, damn, I'm failing. <laughs> she's like, NASCAR! Right, she's like, suffering builds character, but as long as you go through it, like you said, man, to your point. So it ain't just us. It ain't just, we're a lot more like our audience than people think. And, you know, we see it in the comments on YouTube, on social media and everything. We see the back and forth, the interaction. But even though we've made it to the top of our respective fields, mm -hmm. when we go behind the mask, we a lot more like our audience than they think, bro. That's real talk. Real talk. Behind the mask.